Thank you for listening to Radio Maria, a Christian voice in your home. We are now continuing with Jesus, the promised Messiah of Judaism, with Roy Shulman. Hi, this is Roy Shulman, and welcome again to Jesus, the promised Messiah of Judaism. That celebrates the Jewish roots of the Catholic faith, or seen the other way around, that celebrates the completion, the fulfillment of all of the promise of Judaism in the Catholic Church and her sacraments. Well, one can't think of the Catholic Church without thinking of a very a certain young Jewish woman, uh, you know, 14, 15 years old when she was betrothed to, G to uh, Joseph, and she, of course, became the Blessed Virgin Mary. She became the, actually, she became the Queen of Heaven and Earth, um, and she became the Mediatrix of All Graces. And that's what I'm going to speak about today. Now, the reason I want to speak about Mary as the Mediatrix of All Graces today is, first of all, of course, it's always appropriate. It's always appropriate to give her love and honor. And no, we do not worship her and we don't give her worship. That's reserved for God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we do certainly venerate and honor her and acknowledge her role in salvation history. No, no Mary, no Jesus. <laughs> no Mary, no Jesus. And um, it's solid ground to talk about Mary as the Mediatrix of all graces because it has been asserted in numerous um, encyclicals and papal documents and by many saints, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And there is even a feast on the calendar, the Feast of Mary, Mediatrix of all graces, is actually today at least on the 1962 Tridentine calendar from John the 23rd uh, for the extraordinary rite, that is the Latin Mass, the Tridentine rite. Today is the Feast of Mary, Mediatrix of All Graces, which is scheduled for the seventh Saturday of Eastertide, the seventh Saturday after Easter, which is where we are now. So it's the Feast of Mary, Mediatrix of All Graces. Um, on other church calendars, it has occurred, it has appeared at on other dates. Uh, I believe at one point it was November eighth, and at one point it was May thirty first. But on the nineteen sixty two Trinity calendar, it is tied to the date of Easter, and it's the seventh Saturday after Easter, and it is today. So that's why that is our topic for today. Now, when Pope Leo the thirteenth um, established the feast. Um, no, let me back up because I'm confusing two things. Pope Leo the Thirteenth declared in his encyclical of September twenty second, eighteen ninety one. That's before the feast was inaugurated. Quote: We may affirm that nothing by the will of God is given to us without Mary's mediation in such a way that just as no one can approach the Almighty Father except through his Son, likewise no one, so to speak, can approach Christ but through his mother. That is uh, Pope Leo XIII in the encyclical, I don't have the title of the encyclical, but it's the encyclical from uh, September 22, 1891. And then about 30 years later, I think in 1921, the Feast of Mary, Mediatrix of All Graces, was inaugurated, was put on the calendar by uh, Benedict the Fifteenth, if I'm not mistaken. And there is an old principle in the Catholic Church, Lex Orendi, Lex Credendi, um, the law of prayer is the law of belief. Uh, in other words, you can tell by what's prayed, what is believed, and if there is a feast day for Mary, Mediatrix of all graces, it means it's believed that Mary is the Mediatrix of all graces. Now, this is um, a live call-in show. So before I get too carried away, if anyone wishes to call in with questions, and um, I'm always delighted that we have some non-Catholic Christian listeners, perhaps even some non-Christian listeners, and I know that the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary in salvation history and the reverence given to her in the Catholic Church is sometimes 
a issue of some controversy. So if any, if anyone would like to call in with any, any questions or um, complaints, the number here is 866-333-6279 or 866-333-MARY, M-A-R-Y. But um, until somebody does call in, I will simply continue. First of all, how do we know that Mary is the mediatrix of all graces? And as I mentioned earlier, there is a endless, endless number of uh, saints and popes who have asserted it. And I will just go through some of the highlights here. A Saint Bernard of Clairvaux said, quote, God has willed that we should have nothing which would not pass through the hands of Mary. And then Pope Pius XI in 1937 quoted this in his bull In Grava Centibus Malus, quote, Thus it is God's will that we should have everything through Mary. St. Alphonsus Liguori, quote, God, who gave us Jesus Christ, wills that all graces that have been, that are, and will be dispensed to men to the end of the world through the merits of Jesus Christ, should be dispensed by the hands and through the intercession of Mary. Um, let me make two comments here. One is after I go through the assertion from all of these saints and popes that Mary is in fact the mediatrix of all graces, I will explain some of the underlying theology as best I can as to why God arranged things that, that way and the fittingness that God arranged things that way. However, let me go back to this quote from St. Alphonsus Liguori because it's very important to catch this distinction. God, who gave us Jesus Christ, wills that all graces that have been, that are, and will be dispensed to, the, to men to the end of the world through the merits of Jesus Christ. In other words, the source of all of the graces for mankind are the merits of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the source of all the graces. Mary is not the source of grace. Mary does not produce graces, so to speak. Jesus Christ has produced all of the graces for mankind for all time. However, the graces that are dispensed to men through the merits of Jesus Christ, that come from the merits of Jesus Christ, are dispensed by the hands and through the intercession of Mary. You see the importance of this. Mary is not the spring from which graces flow. She is the pipeline, so to speak. Uh, I, I used to draw, get water from an artesian spring, you know, and the spring comes out from the ground and then it would go into a pipe and you would put your jug at the other end of the pipe. Mary is the pipe. She's the pipeline of the graces that flow from Jesus Christ through the merits gained by Jesus Christ. Uh, and I hope this alleviates any concerns that one might think that um, because Mary is the mediatrix of all graces, we're saying that she is the source of grace in a parallel way that Jesus is the source of grace or something like that. No, she's the mediatrix of all graces. Now, continuing with other popes and saints, Pope Benedict XIV said, quote, the Blessed Virgin Mary is like a celestial stream through which the flow of all graces and gifts reach the soul of all wretched mortals. So again, you see how careful these saints and popes are. She is the conduit. She is the channel. She is the stream through which the graces and gifts that flow from, you could say, the Most Holy Trinity, you certainly could say from Jesus Christ, flow through her as through a conduit. They don't find their ultimate source in her. Continuing Pope Pius IX, for God has committed to Mary the treasury of all good things in order that everyone may know that through her are obtained every hope, every grace, and all salvation. Again, through her, not from her. And not from her in a fundamental sense. Pope Leo XIII, quote, Nothing of all of the immense treasury of every grace which the Lord accumulated is imparted to us except through Mary. So again, you see that the Lord is the ultimate source of all grace, 
as Pope Leo XIII said, nothing of all the immense treasury of every grace which the Lord accumulated. The source is the Lord. The Lord gained those graces. However, he imparts them to us through Mary. Um, and, um, and then Pope Benedict XV, who I mentioned earlier, said, or, or wrote actually, all gifts which the author of all good had deigned to communicate to the unhappy posterity of Adam are, according to the loving resolve of his divine providence, dispensed by the hands of the Most Holy Virgin. And again in his apostolic letter, Inter Sodalitia, every kind of grace we receive from the treasury of redemption is ministered, as it were, through the hands of the same sorrowful virgin. And then uh, the last saint that I'm going to mention at this point is Saint Louis Marie de Montfort, who of course is the, the um, saint par excellence of the uh, total consecration to Mary and uh, Mary as the source of all grace. Excuse me, there I made that mistake as the mediatrix of all grace, as the channel of all grace, uh, not the source of all grace. Saint Louis Marie de Montfort wrote, quote, God the Son has communicated to his mother all that he acquired by his life and death, his infinite merits and his admirable virtues, and he has made her the treasurer of all that his father gave him for his inheritance. It is by her that he applies his merits to his members, and that he communicates his virtues and distributes his graces. She is his mysterious canal, she is his aqueduct, through which he makes his mercies flow gently and abundantly. Uh, continuing the quote, to, to Mary, his faithful spouse, God the Holy Ghost has communicated his unspeakable gifts, and he has chosen uh, uh, chosen her to be the dispenser of all he possesses, in such wise that she distributes to whom she will, as much as she wills, as she wills, and when she wills, all his gifts and graces. The Holy Ghost gives no heavenly gift to men which he does not have passed through her virginal hands. Such has been the will of God who has willed that we should have everything through Mary. Now let me again correct myself. That last quote I do not think is from St. Louis de Montfort. I think my notes are a little bit confused. And I believe that the last quote is from St. Maximilian Kolbe. The quote from St. Louis de Montfort ended, um, She is his mysterious canal. She is his aqueduct. She is his aqueduct through which he makes his mercies flow gently and abundantly. In other words, the, that again, that Mary is the channel through which God chooses to distribute all of the graces which were obtained by Jesus. Now, having confused things a little bit in that last little piece, let me explain, so to speak, uh, one could almost say why I confuse them or how why they are easy to confuse. And basically, excuse me, I have to start at the beginning with the most holy trinity, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But before I get into that, let me repeat, this is a live call-in program. And um, frankly, if you're listening, I hope you have questions because this is uh, both very important and somewhat subtle and I'm not doing the world's best job of explaining it. So if you have any questions or, as I said, uh, complaints or issues, the number here is 866-333-6279 or 866-333-MARY and I'll do my best. However, let me go back to the Most Holy Trinity for now until a call comes in. Um, I'm going to get a little personal here, but some of you may know my witness testimony, some of you may not, but I'm a Jewish convert, and um, my um, conversion to the Catholic Church came about in large part through a 
intervention, a fairly direct intervention by the Blessed Virgin Mary. I'll just say uh, an extremely vivid dream I had of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And um, I asked her what title she liked best for herself when she appeared to me in this dream. And her response was, I am the beloved daughter of the Father, mother of the Son, and spouse of the Holy Spirit. And um, I say this because I think to understand Mary as the Mediatrix of all graces, we have to understand that the Most Holy Trinity is three persons. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Blessed Virgin Mary has a unique relationship with each of those three persons separately, with the Father and with the Son and with the Most Holy and with the Holy Spirit. Um, the normal in the normal course of events, one normally thinks of the Blessed Virgin Mary as the mother of Christ, as the mother of Jesus. But she has an absolutely unique relationship with all three persons of the Most Holy Trinity. She is the beloved daughter of the Father. And what do I mean by that? Among other things, of all God created, God created the entire physical world. He created the universe. He created space. He created time. He created energy. He created gravity. He created the atom. Everything he created, he fun everything physical that he created, he fundamentally created for one purpose, which was to be able to make, so to speak, human beings that had who had immortal human souls who would end up in heaven with God for all eternity in a state of unimaginable bliss and also worshiping and loving God and also being loved by God. The entire physical world was created by God so that he could create human beings, human souls, that would eventually be in heaven with him. That was the fundamental purpose of physical creation. Now, of all of the human souls, of all of the human beings, from the beginning of time until the end of time, that God will have created, created or will have created, the most pleasing to him is the Blessed Virgin Mary. She is the only, well, I shouldn't say she's the only human being created without original sin. She's the third human being created without original sin. God created Adam and Eve without original sin, but they managed to um, uh, generate the original sin on their own. And then he created the Blessed Virgin Mary without original sin, and she never, she never um, sinned. She never acquired any sin of her own. So the Blessed Virgin Mary is the only totally sinless human creature that God ever created. Jesus Christ, of course, was um, totally sinless, but he isn't a creature. He wasn't created. Um, I don't want to get too deep into the hypostatic union and the distinction between the, the um, divine nature of Christ and the human nature of Christ. Uh, Christ has a created human nature, but he does not, he is not a created person. He is a divine person with a two natures. So the Blessed Virgin Mary is the only perfect human creature that God ever created. And he, she is therefore the most beloved creature that God has ever created. Um, and I think this is why she's basically in that sense, she's the ultimate success of all creation. Um, she is the pinnacle of creation itself. God created all of, all of physical creation as an expression of his love in order to love creatures and to be loved by them. And Mary is the ultimate example of that. And therefore, she is the ultimately beloved of God. That is, I believe, why when I asked her what title she liked best for herself, one, third, one part of that title was that she was the beloved daughter of God the Father. We're all familiar with the fact that she's also the much-loved mother of God the Son, of Jesus. Which leaves the third part of her self-definition, which is she is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. 
remember that what she said is that she she referred to herself as the beloved daughter of the father mother of the son and spouse of the spirit so what i want to do is or what i will do with the rest of the show is talk about the blessed virgin mary as the spouse of the holy spirit and what that has to do with her being the mediatrix of all graces because i think the fact that she's the spouse of the holy spirit is central to her being the mediatrix of all graces perhaps even more so than her being the mother of jesus is central to her being the mediatrix of all graces now the uh, saint who has elaborated this theology most completely of mary as a spouse of the holy spirit is of course saint maximilian colby so when we come back from the break um i will base my discussion of mary as the spouse of the holy spirit and what that has to do with her being the mediatrix of all graces on the writings of and teachings of saint maximilian colby now, we usually take a short musical break about halfway through this program, and we're not quite halfway through this program, but I want to take the short musical break now uh, in order to invite calls to tell the truth, because it's a very good opportunity to take calls, because then coming out of the musical break, um, I can just turn to the call board and see if any calls have come in, and if they there have been, I will simply take the calls for first before going on to St. Maximilian Kolbe. So um, in honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary, as the Mediatrix of all graces, I am going to play, if I can get the technology to work, sometimes it doesn't, a very beautiful chant of uh, the Salve Regina, the Hail Holy Queen, uh, sung in Latin. Um, I'll give the words for those of us, including me, who don't understand the Latin. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy toward us, and after this our exile show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, most holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Amen. Amen. And with that, let me uh, try to play the chant. Okay, well, I'm sorry. I, I uh, blew something with that... Um, without uh trying to pipe in the music so i guess you'll just have to bear with me deal with me talking i apologize for that um anyway so i will continue although i'm still inviting call uh, inviting phone calls so the number here is 866-333-6278 and uh anyway um Let's see what we have here. Um, anyway, I, I can't figure out uh, uh, right now why the music didn't work. I'm sorry about that. So anyway, um, on to um, Mary as spouse of the Holy Spirit and what that has to do with um, her as the mediatrix of all graces. Um, let me just turn actually to St. Maximilian Kolbe because his words are going to be both much more uh, correct, and his theology is going to be much more correct, needless to say, than mine. So let me read some passages from St. Maximilian Kolbe expounding on this. The third person of the Blessed Trinity never took flesh. Still, our human word spouse is far too weak to express the reality of the relationship between the Immaculata and the Holy Spirit. We can affirm that she is, in a certain sense, the incarnation of the Holy Spirit. Mary is united to the Holy Spirit so closely that we really cannot grasp this union, but we can at least say 
that the Holy Spirit and Mary are two persons who live in such intimate union that they have but one soul life. Let me uh, explain this a little bit and try to justify this a little bit. The Blessed Virgin Mary is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. We know this in many ways, but one of the ways that we know that she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit is that she conceived Jesus in her womb when the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. The act that produces a child in the womb is referred to as a spousal act. It is the act that's proper between spouses. Uh, in fact, in Jewish law, marriage is produced by consummating the spousal act, that that is actually what brings about the marriage. There is a ceremony in front of the rabbi usually, but that does not produce the marriage. There is a marriage contract, which is typical, is, is conventional, but that does not produce the marriage. It's actually the spousal union that produces the marriage. And you see that already in the story of um, uh, Isaac and, um, oh boy, in the Old Testament, when um, when you had Rachel and Leah, uh, anyway, the, the story, I, I, I don't want to trip over myself, so I'm not going to go into that. But you see several incidents in the uh, Old Testament where the spousal union produces a marriage, even when the spousal union is accidental, as it was in the case of uh, Leah. So anyway, the, the um, overshadowing of the Mary by the Holy Spirit that produced Jesus was a spousal union, and the spous and spousal union is indissoluble. From that moment on and for all eternity, the Blessed Virgin Mary was the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Now, among human beings, the spousal union is the most is the closest relationship possible between two distinct persons. Uh, remember, Jesus said, uh, the two become one flesh. It's also in the Old Testament that the two become one flesh. So, given that the spousal union is the closest, most intimate uh, union between two persons as possible, and the Blessed Virgin Mary is, has entered into a spousal union with the Holy Spirit, it's not that the Blessed Virgin Mary is an incarnation of the Holy Spirit, of course not, but she is united to the Holy Spirit more closely than any other human creature is united to God. That's what it basically amounts to. And I'll continue with St. Maximilian Kolbe on this. This is a direct quote. The Holy Spirit is in Mary, after the fashion, one might say, in which the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the Word, is in his humanity. There is, of course, this difference. In Jesus there are two natures, divine and human, but one single person who is God. Mary's nature and person are totally distinct from the nature and person of the Holy Spirit. Still, their union is so inexpressible and so perfect that the Holy Spirit acts only by the Immaculata, his spouse. This is why she is the mediatrix of all graces, given by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say, repeat that. The Holy Spirit is in Mary, after the fashion, one might say, in which the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the Word, is in his humanity. There is, of course, this difference. In Jesus there are two natures, divine and human, but one single person who is God. In the union, and now I'm going to do an explanation, this is in the words of Maximilian Kolbe now. In the union of the Holy Spirit and Mary, there isn't one person, there are two persons, and there are still two persons. There's the person of the Holy Spirit and the person of Mary. They are not one person, like the divine and human nature are one person in Jesus. However, there are two persons who are united more closely, or in the manner, in the, the most, 
I'm tripping over myself today, huh? Um, their union is more intimate and more complete than any other type of union that's possible between two persons because it is the spousal union. Going back to St. Maximilian Kolbe word for word, quote, Mary's nature and person are totally distinct from the nature and person of the Holy Spirit. Still, their union is so inexpressible and so perfect that the Holy Spirit acts only by the Immaculata, his spouse. This is why she is the mediatrix of all graces given by the Holy Spirit. Close quote. Um, I will continue with St. Maximilian Kolbe because I am not doing a good job <laughs> uh, ad-libbing. United, uh, so this is now back to directly quoting from St. Maximilian Kolbe, quote, United to the Holy Spirit as his spouse, the Blessed Virgin Mary is one with God in incomparably more perfect way than can be said of any other creature. What sort of union is this? It is above all an interior union, a union of her essence with the essence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in her, lives in her. In the Holy Spirit's union with Mary, we observe more than the love of two beings. In one, there is all the love of the Blessed Trinity. In the other, all of creation's love. So it is that in this union, heaven and earth are joined, all of heaven with all the earth, the totality of eternal love with the totality of created love. It is truly the summit of love. Now, um, we get to an uh, interesting additional little point that, that um, Max, St. Maximilian Kolbe brought up, which is um, all stems from, remember that when the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to Bernadette at Lourdes, and Bernadette was asked by her pastor to find out the name of the lady who was appearing, and Bernadette asked her, uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary replied, I am the Immaculate Conception. Now, Bernadette didn't even know what that meant uh, at the time. She didn't know what the words meant. She had to repeat them over and over to herself so she would remember the words as she ran to the pastor to tell him what the Blessed Virgin Mary had said, I am the Immaculate Conception. In fact, it was only a few years after I mean, the apparition at Lourdes was only a few years after the dogma of the Immaculate Conception had been established. Um, and so St. Maximilian Kolbe was very interested in why did the Blessed Virgin Mary say, I am the Immaculate Conception, rather than saying, I am the one who was immaculately conceived. Immaculately conceived, of course, referring to the fact that she did not inherit original sin as every other human creature since Adam and Eve did. Um, that Let me actually uh, underline that a little bit, especially since I, I, I mean, I know we also have non-Catholic listeners. The Immaculate Conception does not refer to the conception of Jesus inside the womb of Mary uh, without human intervention, so to speak. Her virginal, con you could say that's the virginal conception because she was virgin before she conceived Jesus, um, during the conception of Jesus, after she conceived Jesus, and after she bore Jesus. So, however, that's not what the Immaculate Conception refers to. The Immaculate Conception refers to the fact that Adam and Eve incurred original sin when they sinned. They are the parents of all human creatures since then them and all human creatures inherited the sin from Adam and Eve, original sin, which flowed through human reproduction, you could say, through the line of humanity since Adam and Eve, through every human creature since them, since them, with the exception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who was spared the fate of inheriting original sin. That's what it refers to when she is referred to as the Immaculate Conception. But why did she say, I am the Immaculate Conception, rather than I was immaculately conceived? And here is what St. Maximilian Kolbe wrote 
um, just actually just before he was taken off to die at Auschwitz. If among human beings the wife takes the name of her husband because she belongs to him, is one with him, becomes equal to him, and is with him the source of new life, with how much greater reason should the name of the Holy Spirit, who is the divine immaculate conception, be used as the name of her in whom he lives as uncreated love, the principle of life in the whole supernatural order of grace. I'm going to repeat that and I'm going to point out what he's saying. He's basically saying here that a wife takes the name of her husband and the Holy Spirit is the divine immaculate conception. And so the Blessed Virgin Mary, as the spouse of the Holy Spirit, and also as the human Immaculate Conception, how appropriate that she took the name of her husband. And then with that little explication, let me repeat the, the sentence from um, St. Maximilian Kolbe. If among human beings the wife takes the name of her husband because she belongs to him, is one with him, becomes equal with him, and is with him the source of new life, with how much greater reason should the name of the Holy Spirit, who is the divine Immaculate Conception, be used as the name of her in whom he lives, as uncreated love, the principle of life in the whole supernatural order of grace. So, um, let me, let me um, continue with this discussion of St. Maximilian Kolbe's reflection on why the Blessed Virgin Mary identified herself as the Immaculate Conception when she appeared to St. Bernadette at Lourdes. Immaculate, con the, quote, this is the beginning of a, a, a passage entirely written by St. Maximilian Kolbe, quote, Immaculate Conception. These words fell from the lips of the Immaculata herself. Hence, they must tell us in the most precise and essential manner who she really is. The Father begets the Son, the Spirit proceeds from Father and Son. And who is the Holy Spirit? The flowering of the love of the Father and the Son. If the fruit of created love is a created conception, then the fruit of divine love, that prototype of all created love, is necessarily a divine conception. The Holy Spirit is therefore the, quote, uncreated eternal conception, close quote, the prototype of all the conceptions that multiply life throughout the whole universe. The Father begets, the Son is begotten, the Spirit is the conception that springs from their love. There we have the intimate life of the three persons by which they can be distinguished one from another. But they are united in the oneness of their nature, of their divine existence. The Spirit is then this thrice holy conception, this infinitely holy, immaculate conception. Everywhere in this world we notice action, and the reaction which is equal but contrary to it, departure and return, going away and coming back, separation and reunion. The separation always looks forward to union, which is creative. All this is simply an image of the Blessed Trinity in the activity of creatures. Union means love, creative love. Divine activity outside the Trinity itself follows the same pattern. First, God creates the universe, that is something like a separation. Creatures, by following the natural law implanted in them by God, reach their perfection, become like him, and go back to him. Intelligent creatures love him in a conscious manner. Through this love they unite themselves more and more closely with him, and so find their way back to him. The creature most completely filled with this love, filled with God himself, was the Immaculata, who never contracted the slightest stain of sin, who never departed in the least from God's will. 
I wish I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm kind of burning with a desire to kind of explicate this, explain it, but I'm afraid that all I'll do is tie myself in knots. Um, this is incredibly beautiful. It's also quite deep. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm not adequate to it. I'm not adequate to it. Um, St. Maximilian Colby is expressing it um, quite concisely, but at the same time, quite pristinely, quite, quite uh, purely. I'll give it a shot, but I might actually lose ground in trying to explain this. God created creation. The, the movement of creation, the movement out from God, you know, the, the, the emanation of creation from God is the beginning of a cycle which is supposed to return to God. God created human creatures out of love, out of his love for us, and then we, by our love for him, are supposed to find our way back to him for all eternity, which is going to be the case if and when, God willing, we get to heaven. So you have this circle, you have this cycle of God's love creating the creature and then the creature's love of God enabling him to return to God. The creature who was created with the most love of God was the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the creature who returns to God with the most love is the Blessed Virgin Mary. I guess that's it. <laughs> that's, as good, that's the best I can do. That's as good as I can do. Now, this is almost your last chance, so I'll just say it one more time. The number is 866-333-6279 or 866-333-MARY, M-A-R-Y. And um, if you wish to call in with a question or a comment, you may do so now. Um, and uh, I, I, I wish you would do so because I think there must be, there must be uh, questions and comments to this. Uh, however, um, until, until you do, I will try to continue. Um, uh, but I don't know. I don't know, actually. I think maybe all I can do really is, 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 I, I'm, I'm going to repeat myself. So if this is all clear to you, you can, you can, you can go on to do something else now, but I cannot, I cannot speak through this. Um, in my own words, because it's just too deep. And um, so I just have to go back. I'm just going to go back once more. I'll cycle through quickly. The show is probably going to end on the early side um, if there are no calls, because I allowed time for calls and there are no calls. So, so the show is probably going to end in about five minutes. But I will reread some of these incredibly beautiful passages from St. Maximilian Kolbe and from the popes and saints about being the Blessed Virgin Mary being the Mediatrix of all grace uh, before, I, uh, before I sign off. The Blessed Virgin Mary is united to the Holy Spirit so closely that we cannot grasp this union, but we can at least say that the Holy Spirit and Mary are two persons who live in such intimate union that they have but one soul life. The Holy Spirit is in Mary after the fashion, one might say, in which the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the Word, is in his humanity. There is, of course, this difference. In Jesus there are two natures, human and divine, but one single person. Mary's nature and person are totally distinct from the nature and person of the Holy Spirit. Still, their union is so inexpressible and so perfect that the Holy Spirit acts only by the Immaculata, his spouse. 
This is why she is the mediatrix of all graces given by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, uh, this is me speaking now, Jesus has two natures, a divine nature and a human nature, and they are joined in one person, Jesus. He's, one, he's only one person with two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. That's called the hypostatic union. The, the union between the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Holy Spirit is different. There is a human nature and a human person in Mary, and a divine nature and a divine person in the Blessed Virgin Mary, but they are united, those two persons, in the most intimate manner possible for two persons to be united, which is the spousal union, which is why the um, St. Maximilian Kolbe refers to the Blessed Virgin Mary as the quasi-incarnation of the Holy Spirit. She's not the incarnation of the Holy Spirit because they're two persons, not one, but those two persons are united in a more intimate way than, or in the most intimate way, I should say, that two persons can be united. Now, I think we have a caller. So um, if we have a caller, if you could uh, put him or her on the line and if you could uh, tell me your name. Oh, hello. My name is John. Hi. Did you have a uh, comment or yeah. a question? Yeah, just a question. Uh, what's the relationship between uh, Mary, Mediatrix of All Graces, and Mary as Co-Redemptrix? You know something? Thank you for the question. Um, I'm telling you, I was afraid somebody would notice that. Uh, because early in the show, I was kind of careful to say I was talking about Mary as the Mediatrix of All Graces, rather than as Co-Redemptrix. And... Um, uh, boy, you know, I'm a little bit reluctant to fly by the seat of my pants on that. Um, I'll, I'll try, and then I, if I am not comfortable with what I said, I'm, I'm going to have to backpedal. Um, the, the Blessed Virgin Mary participated in the suffering of Jesus more than any other martyr, I would say, more than any other human creature ever participated or will participate in the suffering of Jesus. Um, Jesus is, all of Jesus' suffering throughout his life, and uh, particularly his passion and his death on the cross, were felt by the soul of Mary in a very unique way, such that she suffered what he suffered, although not in a physically manifested way, but only in an interior way. Nonetheless, she suffered everything that he suffered. And somehow that, um, and, and of course, all of our suffering is redemptive, right? Even, I mean, you know, you know, a lot of Catholics, a lot of good Catholics have grown up, you know, doing a morning offering, offering up all of their sufferings and trials of the day in union with the suffering of Jesus for the redemption of souls. So all suffering united with the suffering of Jesus is redemptive. You don't have to be the Blessed Virgin Mary to participate in the redemption, so to speak, brought by Jesus, or contributing, I should say, to the redemption brought by Jesus. We all can do that by uniting our suffering with that of Jesus. The person who united more suffering with that of Jesus than any other human creature was the Blessed Virgin Mary. She suffered more than any other human creature and she united that suffering most perfectly with the suffering of Jesus. Now, why that should result in her being called co-redemptrix, um, I don't really want to speak to. I mean, in an airplane, you have the pilot and you have the co-pilot. And the pilot might actually be licensed at a higher level than the co-pilot. I mean, maybe somebody qualifies to be a co-pilot, but doesn't qualify to be a pilot. So co doesn't, doesn't establish actual equality, but it does establish a kind of auxiliary role. And I believe that when Mary is referred to as the co-redemptrix, it is in that sense. It's not that she in any way, needless to say, it would be ridiculous to say that her role is equal to that of Jesus or the same as that of Jesus or as great as that of Jesus. However, she is cooperating more than any other 
uh, human creature could possibly cooperate. And I think it's on that basis that um, she is given the title of co-redemptrix. I don't know if you're still on the line, John, and whether that helps. No, that helps. Thanks, Ray. I appreciate the answer. Okay, thanks. Uh, and and by the way, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm tempted to say, don't take me. You know, I, I'm, I'm unlicensed to talk about such uh, deep and delicate theology. So if it, you know, if it spurs your thoughts and if it leads your thoughts in a certain way, that makes sense. Wonderful. Um, I would recommend perhaps uh, Mark Miravalli is a Marian theologian who has written extensively about this. I think uh, Edward Sree has written about this. There are, um, you know, there are Catholic fully licensed theologians with imprimaturs that explain this um, with more, with an imprimatur, basically with the guarantee that they are being true to the underlying theology. As I said earlier, I'm flying by the seat of my pants. However, if I'm flying by the seat of my pants, I'm coming in for a landing now because we've come to the end of our hour. So um, I will say goodbye for now. I will just, this is a silly comment to make, but um, this weekend, this, this next weekend, that is the weekend of um, whatever that is, May 15th, 16th, I will be uh, speaking at a conference at Ave Maria University in Florida. It's a free conference. It's open to the public. So if anyone's listening within a short drive of um, Naples, Florida, which is more or less where Ave Maria University is, I look forward to seeing you there. And um, the other presenters there, what reminded me of that is Mark Miravalli is going to be a presenter there. And uh, he's the right person to ask uh, questions about the fifth Marian dogma it's referred to, which is um, there has been a movement for about the last 20 years to establish a fifth Marian dogma, which would be the, officially proclaiming that the Blessed Virgin Mary is the mediatrix of all graces and co-redemptrix. So with that, I will say goodbye and I um, hope you enjoyed this and I uh, hope you join us again next week on Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism on Radio Maria with me, your host, Roy Shoman. Bye for now.